Chapter 3. The speaker's Castilian lisp was so pronounced, it made Gwen laugh and then wish immediately she hadn't. It had been uttered, after all, with such brightness and a, in a true spirit of helpfulness in response to Alex's question, ¿Dónde está con de hermanos? The young woman behind the front desk could not help that to make matters worse, she had exceedingly buck teeth, and the answer contained a disproportionate amount of S's. La Avenida de los Concepción de San Jerónimo, she chimed emphatically while traces of saliva spewed not unnoticeably from her lips. Alice, d no. <laughs> Although Alex did not laugh, he was caught off guard and said again, this time slightly incredulously, ¿Dónde? Oh, Alex, don't make her say it again, Gwen implored, having just regained her composure. Ah, but it was too late, and once again the young woman unabashedly replied, La avenida de los concepción de San Jerónimo, she enunciated each syllable for the benefit of the Americanos, no doubt, but still to great comic effect. <clears throat> this time, Gwen kept a straight face using a technique she had devised in childhood when fits of giggling would sometimes overtake her in church. For some odd reason, a quick mental recitation of a Hail Mary would usually sober her up in no time. Lo, these many years later, the prayer still worked like a charm. Fortunately, Alex understood the young woman this time. Gracias. Senorita, adios, he said, grinning from ear to ear as they departed with their hard-won information. Alex, that was very rude, Gwen pointed out matter-of-factly as they headed out in the direction of Conde Hermanos. Why, what? Alex smiled. Gwen did not smile back. Making fun of a foreign language is simply not acceptable, and you know it. I wasn't making fun of a foreign language, my one true love. I was simply trying it out. Can I help it if I'm having fun practicing? Entirely too much fun, Gwen chided as they came upon an unobtrusive looking storefront that bore the name they had been seeking, Conde Hermanos. They stared at each other in disbelief. They were standing in front of the very door at the very place they had journeyed so far to reach. A wave of reverence washed over them both and they were tempted to genuflect before passing through the door. Everyone who enters Conde Hermanos enters for one purpose only, to buy a guitar. And not just any guitar, but one of the finest guitars on the face of the earth is their objective, as is Ferrari to the racing world. So is the name Conde Hermanos to aficionados of fine guitars. And just like a Ferrari that deserves to be handle and appreciate the precision of its craft should fall only into the hands of an accomplished musician who can coax out all the beauty that so mysteriously resides in each and every guitar. Of course, there were a few competitors in Madrid. A Ramirez, for example, was a comparable instrument. But nonetheless, each guitar maker had a unique secret that was guarded for generations and as closely kept as a recipe for Swiss chocolate. Inside the shop, guitars were hanging everywhere from the rafters like hams being protected from worms in the mercados. Gwen and Alex explained the amount of money they were prepared to spend and then were shown a half a dozen guitars to choose from. The task of selecting fell to Gwen as she was the accomplished musician in the family she also had played her teacher's Conde Hermanos for the past year and thus had acquired an educated ear for excellence. 
Although her own guitar, a Japanese takamini, was a respectable instrument, it was intended only for a classical repertoire. The Conde Hermanos, however, was made for flamenco, and Gwen had been thoroughly captivated of late by this newfound form. So captivated, in fact, was she that traveling to Madrid in search of the perfect guitar had, been a, had made complete sense to her. She proceeded to play each instrument in turn quite thoughtfully, knowing her decision would last a lifetime. It was necessary to feel each one out using a variety of fingering techniques, the piccato, the rasgiado, but as with all meaningful relationships, the final decision would be made with the heart and due entirely to some inexplicable and unspoken chemistry. Surprisingly, it was not difficult to make her choice so clearly from the others. It was of the palest and driest of woods and consequently light as a feather. Its lightness belied its strength for this instrument had the deepest and most powerful resonance. She also felt uncannily like it was selecting her not unlike the scrawniest kitten in the litter that wobbles unsteadily out of the bunch and climbs directly onto your lap, the one that chooses you, really, not the other way around. And that's the one Gwendolyn chose back, and she was very happy in this decision. How odd it seemed then, ten years later, that she had lost the Conde Hermanos to Alex in an otherwise amicable divorce. Why he had laid claim to it so strongly truly disconcerted her. He even remembered the story entirely differently, enlarging his role in the decision-making process more and more over the years. But it was Gwen who knew what had really happened and therefore felt a strange void in her heart. Gwendolina, amor de mi vida, I have an important questione para ti. Rogelio stated this on bended knee with a playful twinkle in his eye. Fire away, Gwen responded, always amused by Rogelio, a mere youngster half her age with such beguiling ways. La questione es why, why, mi cielo, were you born too soon? Too soon for what, silly? Be more specifico, por favor. Too soon for me, mi amor, he replied, dramatically wiping away an imagined tear. But you see, that's not me, a culpa, joven, Gwen explained with mock patience. It's yours. You, mijo, were born too late. See, si, it's verdad, he conceded. But there could have been something muy especial between us, Gwendolina. Oh, Rogelio, hermanito, there is something muy especial between us. And it was true. After the divorce, Gwen had taken a terrible job to make ends meet, and without Rogelio could not have survived the tawdry monotony of getting through each day. Making music had taken a back seat to paying the rent and... As so often happens in these cases, the human spirit was languishing. How she even wound up selling oriental rugs never ceased to amaze her. They were undeniably exquisite, understandably expensive, and worst of all, ridiculously heavy. And that's where Rahelio came in. With the help of a dolly and a back support, he made short work of endlessly furling and unfurling these unwieldy, albeit extraordinary, behemoths. On the days when new shipments arrived, he and Gwen, while engaged together in the long and tedious process of matching each new rug to its number on a packing slip, had time to talk extensively about their lives. It was on such a day that Gwen told Rogelio, about the Conde Hermanos. No se preocupes, mija, la guitarra will return to you, Rogelio said, as if stating the obvious. Gwen queried back, Laws, Vera, the laws of physicos, he proclaimed, 
professorially. And what laws of physics might that be, maestro? Gwen asked with amused interest. Oh, muchacha, Walters, the emperor, finds its way. And Gwen mentally strove to make the connection. And Amor returns to Amor. You loved the guitar, no? You traveled far to find it, see? You chose it with your corazón. You played it with Amor. Entonces, la guitar loves you too, and she will travel far to find you. Is that really possible? Gwen wondered out loud. Por supuesto, la guitarra has a spiritu, an alma. It is her spiritu that will find you. The questione now is, will you recognize her? <clears throat> How could I not know her? Because she will come in a disguise, mujer, but she will come. Así es la vida, Gwendolina. Es verdad, mi amor. Strangely, <clears throat> these words filled Gwen with something she had not felt in a very long time, hope. Rogelio had imparted this wisdom to Gwen on September 16th, the actual Mexican Independence Day. He told her Americanos made a big deal about Cinco de Mayo because it was easy to pronounce, whereas Dia si seis de Septiembre was too much of a mouthful, but he insisted that they should celebrate by taking two bottles of Corona to the beach and toasting his beloved homeland as the sun set. Two weeks later, <clears throat> on September 30th, he suggested they repeat the ritual. So soon, Rogelio? Why? Because today is a day that is muy importante. It's the feast of San Jerónimo, Rogelio answered definitively. Well, who the heck is San Jerónimo? Gwen asked, vaguely recalling having heard the name somewhere before. San Jerónimo tamed the lion, mujer, and on this day he gives courage to those who remember, Rogelio explained solemnly. Gwen realized that San Jerónimo was probably St. Jerome, but she had forgotten the details of the story. How exactly did he pull that off, hombre? Because he understood, Rogelio replied, as usual, dispensing information sparingly and mysteriously, keeping his audience ever in suspense. Understood what, for God's sake, Rogelio? Gwen asked in exasperation. Understood the lion, for God's sake, Gwendolina, came his quick reply. You see, the lion was a monster who scared all the people. But San Jerónimo thought, Por qué? Why is the lion so angry? He must have a reason. Then he noticed the thorn in the lion's paw and took it out. Just like that? How could he possibly? I told you, mija. Con coraje, we need coraje. No, así es la vida, mi amor. Y por eso we should go again to La Playa and honor San Jerónimo. Okay, okay, I get it, Raleo. After work, we will go. It was dusk. The sun had set, not over the Pacific Ocean, but over the coastal ranges. Every evening it would creep out from behind those mountains more and more until the winter when it would set spectacularly over the ocean once again. Gwen and Rogelio had said salud to San Jerónimo and finished the last of their coronas. At Rogelio's suggestion, they had also each written a wish on a piece of paper, which he had then rolled up and set on fire with a match. He released it into the air where it was quickly uplifted by the warm Santa Ana wind and sent in the direction of the sea. These wishes will be muy powerful, Gwendolina, he assured her. 
Their power comes from the wind, which is muy fuerte tonight. As they watched the embers and ash scattering in the sand, he added, I think I know what you wished for. I think you do too. It was as they contemplated the afterglow of the sunset, the streaks of orange and amethyst across the sky, that a loud and plaintive cry came from somewhere close by. They were sitting cross-legged on the sand and the sound seemed to be approaching. It was an insistent sound and Gwen wondered if it was in fact an injured seagull. Something was coming more into view and did indeed appear to be very white. Oh, Rogelio, look, it's a stray cat or what? It was hard to discern almost everything in the dying daylight. No, Gwendolina, I think it is an abandoned kitten. He looks muy flaco, and yet he cries muy fuerte. He's mucho hungry. Pobrecita, Rogelio, are you sure? And with that, a small white creature, the scrawniest and loudest of kittens, climbed directly onto her lap. He was as light as a feather, but surprisingly strong as he nudged Gwen's hand to stroke his head. He then proceeded to purr <clears throat> with a deep resonance that belied the frail structure of his thin body. Do wishes come true always like this, Rogelio, so instantaneously on the feast of San Jeronimo? Gwen whispered, wrapping the contented kitten safely in her sweater, no, mi amor, only under certain conditions when certain laws of physicals are already in place. Now, vamonos muchacha, it's time to get the kittens something to eat. And with that, they headed back, their way surprisingly well lit by a slender crescent moon that had appeared suddenly in the sky. <laughs>